Okay, um, then uh, welcome back to the lab part of today. Um, so to shortly recap where we left off last week and sort of motivate why we do the things we do today. Um, so we ended last week uh, training this uh, this pre-trained model, like fine-tuning TF Distilbert. Um, and if I can find the solid at some point, we went to the issue that somewhere over here, okay, so the output here is not safe, but we entered the issue that this took way too long. So somewhere around uh, 30 minutes per layer or 30 hours per layer, I'm not quite sure, but something with a 30 in it. Um, and our solution to that was, well, let's just ship it to the cluster, package it into a Docker container, and then execute it on much more powerful hardware um, to train it in a matter of minutes instead of hours. And then we introduced Docker last week and also uh, gave you a few pointers on how you can gain access to our hardware. Um, I hope that you all went through the setup steps that uh, we, we set out in the mail from last, uh, from last session um, and now successfully are able to use the cluster or at least log into the SSH. How to use it will be the content of today's lecture or today's lab. Um, so the plan for today is on the one hand to build a Docker image that we can uh, use to, to train our model. Um, and this will be a generic uh, it, generic image. We won't put any of our code inside. We just save all the dependencies that our program needs to execute on the cluster into the Docker image, and then use that image on the cluster as sort of a basis to train our model on. Um, so all different dependencies are already pre-installed for us. That's the first part, um, and we will do that using GitHub Actions. So we won't build it locally and then push it to Docker Hub, which would be the like basic version. Um, there are two reasons why we won't do that, which I will uh, also go into more detail later on. The, the most basic one is that whatever hardware you have here might not be what the cluster needs in terms of, uh, in terms of so if I would build it on this Mac, which is based on the uh, ARM um, instruction set, yet the cluster uses x86, uh, I would run into problems that are quite hard to solve. So I just automate all the boring stuff and um, let the GitHub Actions build the image for me, push it for me, and I just have to, at some point, press a button and will always regenerate my image. Okay. Um, so for today, uh, we have... Um, requirements txt, which I will not go into detail about, it's just, a, I think there's one package added to one, but it should be quite the same as the one we already gave you in the beginning of the semester, with the addition of the, well, we can have a short look into it, um, with the addition of this uh, W and B library, so it's weights and biases, which is a web platform um, to track deep learning experiments. Um, you can also have a look on the website. Um, and that will give you a lot of diagnostics and make sense of your logs. And, and Niklas will talk about that in much more detail later on. So we need this for parameter sweeping. So uh, finding out what parameters to train our model with for the best results, which will then be uh, the second half of the session. OK, so for the first part, um, we will take where we left off last week and then uh, automate building a Docker image. And then Niklas will take it over and take this Docker image deployed on Gamma Web and do some fancy parameter sweeps um, based on that. Since we use GitHub Actions to uh, automate the whole thing, um, we will begin the session by creating an empty uh, Git repository on GitHub. Um, and I'm just going to name it Docker Workflow. You can name it whatever you want. Um, it also doesn't really matter if you put it in public or private. Um, if you use it, uh, if you put it into public, everyone will be able to see your Docker images if that's a concern to you. Um, if you put it into private, it's hidden from it will not accept you. However, it has the added uh, sort of downside that you need to implement a way of the cluster authenticating to be able to pull the image. Um, so to illustrate the step, I will now let this uh, on private so we can later exemplify this authentication step. Okay, um, this is now just an empty repository and I will clone that to 
my local machine. Let me just switch to the terminal. And I hope that's readable in terms of font size. I can increase it a bit more if you want, but it's fine. Okay. So I'm first going to clone my Git repository. Um, well, we don't have anything in there, so of course it's an empty one. And then uh, I will change into it. And um, the first uh, the first piece of files that I put into there are the requirements file, um, because these requirements specify whatever Python packages we need on the cluster. Um, so I'm just going to copy the um, file that we specified in the lab session notes today uh, on the website. So we can just use this requirements file um, output um, and download it here. Maybe have a short look into it. And there's a typo. Um, and we require that. Yeah, now it should work. Um, yeah, this is just the same one that I just showed you on the web browser. Uh, you can get this link from the website. Um, I just copied it over. OK, let me resize my window because Zoom keeps overlapping it. Perfect. Um, so the next task for us is to build a Docker image. And as you might recall from last week, the way you specify a Docker image is through a Docker file. So I'm going to create an empty Docker file. Um, this is Vim now just because I don't want to switch between terminal and text editor all the time, but you can use whatever software you want as long as it's plain text. Um, and as Yannick explained to you last week, every Docker image or every Docker file that specifies an image begins with the form line. Um, so some kind of base image that you are adding on top on. Um, of course, you could add uh, from scratch, which would just put an empty image there and nothing is inside and you have to build everything yourself. But it's generally advisable to use the like image that's closest to what you want to solve and then base your, th your things on that uh, because it just saves you a lot of time setting up all the dependencies. So in our case, we want to do deep learning on NVIDIA hardware. And there are two main libraries that we would need to install for that, which is CUDA. It's kind of the NVIDIA computation library and uh, CUDNN, which I think stands for CUDA Deep Neural Network, but I'm not sure. Um, but we also need that. So instead of using a Scratch or Ubuntu image or any kind of other general base image, we can already import a very specialized base image from NVIDIA that they provide to us um, to, to base our process on that. And the image uh, is specified by this rather cryptic string. So this just specifies that the image we are trying to base our image on is comes from NVIDIA. So everything before the backslash is the, I think it's called an organization on Docker Hub. Um, so the company or collective of people that publish this image. And then after that is the actual name of the image. Um, so this is the name and the rest of it is uh, just tagging. So we have the CUDA image, which contains all the CUDA resources that we need to execute on the cluster. And then there are several different versions. So we are going to use the CUDA version 11.2.2. And we also want to have QDNN 8 installed on this image. Um, so there, there are images that just stop at CUDA and don't have QDNN. Um, we want that because we need it for TensorFlow. Um, this signifies that this is the development version of the image, not the production version. And the most important difference here is that this development image contains libraries that allow us to use um, the TensorBot profiler, um, which just makes more lower level machine metrics available to us. And the last part is which version of Ubuntu this image is based upon. We're just going to use 18.04. There are also versions of the same image on Ubuntu 20 or Ubuntu 16, I think, too. Um, but just for compatibility reasons, uh, we're going to stick with Ubuntu 18 here. So this image right here now is an Ubuntu image that has CUDA and CUDNN in their development versions already pre-installed for us, so we don't need to worry about that. This would allow us to access the A100 hardware that's uh, built 
into the cluster. Um, and so whatever we add now to this, just, just for our personal uh, setup, what our program needs. So this is the hardware side of requirements and we now deal with the software side. Um, so the first thing to fix here is an argument. Um, and I will first type it out and then explain what it does. So Debian front end equals non-interactive. Um, this tells the underlying Ubuntu or Debian image that we don't, under any circumstances, want to be in a position that we need to interact with this image um, or rather the build process of this image. So if Docker uses this Docker file to build an image for us, we can't have any interactive prompts. We can't put in a yes or no if it asks us if we want to install a package or not. Um, so we turn this interactive mode off and just basically tell Debian just run with it, whatever we specify, just run it, don't ask questions. Um, it's going to be fine. So after we set this uh, non-interactive variable, we can then use the uh, Ubuntu package manager with APT um, to install some programs that we need, more specifically Python. So first uh, we're going to run update and then um, we run install. And nope, that's supposed to be a Y. Um, before I specify the, the packages, this just ensures that our APT manager is up to date with the uh, Ubuntu uh, package repository. And this minus Y just tells APT to just everything that prompted, just say yes. Um, so it's a shorthand for it, say yes. Um, I could rewrite this into two separate run statements. And this would result in, well, not the same image, but a similar image, at least from the surface look of it. But every run statement introduces another layer. If you recall from last week that Docker images are built in layers and layers can be cached. So if we instead bind this into one single or combine this into one single run statement, we also get one single layer that is cached. And so if anything, um, it just makes for more efficient building if you try to combine or if you try to keep the amount of layers as low as possible. So having these in one combined call just makes sense from that standpoint. Okay, um, I'm actually going to specify the packages. So no install, we commence. I'm actually not quite sure, Nick, just what this no install recommends does because I don't use Ubuntu. Um, but I guess it just skips packages that we would need if it were a real system, but not in the it, stock it setup. It skips uh, optional dependencies. Oh, okay. So yeah, thank you. Um, the packages we're actually interested in are Python 3.8. Um, and then Python 3.8 uh, distutils, did I spell that right? Yes. Um, so this gives us the Python 3.8 executable that we can use to run our code. And then the distribution utils, which um, will come in handy later if you deal with pip and stuff like this. And also we need curl. Uh, for some reason, curl is not pre-installed on this Ubuntu base image. So um, just going to install this along with it. However, this base image does has a Python version and we just want Python 3.8, not whatever is in the image. Um, so we need to tell the Docker image that our default now is Python 3.8 and whatever you call under Python 3 should be interpreted by the Python 3.8 executable. So we can add another run statement and uh, say update alternatives, alternatives, which is uh, a built-in Ubuntu command. Um, and we want to overwrite or specify that user bin Python 3 points to um, wait, user, that's not a backslash, no, user, in Python 3.8. And now whatever we call with Python 3 will just default to Python version 3.8. The next step is to install pip. Um, we just downloaded only the Python, or we installed only the Python runtime, not the pip package manager. So that's still to do. Um, 
So we can run this curl statement, which is taken from the pip website and their way of installing it. Um, I will just copy over this link because I don't want to type it out. So it's just a Python script to install pip for you. So we don't need to actually spell out all the uh, program magic. And I'm going to do something that is very much decouraged in most settings. Um, I'm going to pipe something I downloaded off the web directly into an executable program. It's the easiest way to do this, but generally first check whatever is behind this link. Um, in this case, I know that this link is fine, so I can pipe it, um, but be aware that whatever is in here will get executed. And if you don't check it beforehand, you can run any kind of code in your system. Okay, we now should have uh, pip installed. So we took this installer script, piped it into Python 3 so it get ex executed, and now our image has another layer which contains pip. Um, and then we can do some pip maintenance. So we run Python pip. We first upgrade it into the uh, newest version. And then we are going to install some um, basic packages, in this case, only setup tools. And we want this uh, to have no cache directory. Um, once again, pay attention, this is combined into one single statement. We could split it up into two run statements. We just put it into one to save uh, the layer count. Um, since these will mostly operate together anyways, so it's just a redundant layer if we would put it into two run statements. Okay, at this point, we have our system set up. Uh, we have Python 3, we have pip. What we lack now is our packages that we want to use within our um, Docker image. However, the requirements file that specifies these packages is not actually present in the Docker file yet. So the next step is to copy this over from our local file system. Um, Docker has the copy command. So copy just takes something on your hard drive and puts it into the image. And we are going to copy over the requirements, txt, and the dot just puts it on the root level or the current directory um, or current work directory as it's called in Docker um, of your Docker image. Um, it's generally advisable to copy over things as late as possible in your layer stack. Because if I were to put this copy statement right up here at the front, so I could also do copy up here. However, if my requirements file at some point changes, this copy layer at, at line three would get invalidated because the underlying uh, data object changes. And so every layer that comes afterwards also would need to be rebuilt. Um, by having this copy statement down below here, if I change my requirements file, Docker can reuse all the different uh, layers that I introduced up here. So nothing changed about this statement, nothing changed about this. Um, this will also get cached. And only if our requirements file changes, Docker will jump in at this, sort, at this point in the layer stack and start re rebuilding from there, um, including our changes. So now that we have our requirements file, we can run the usual um, pip install minus r requirements .txt and once again without caching. And that's it. That's all the things we need to specify. You can view this, these Docker files as kind of a shell script. If you were on the virtual machine, you would run a shell script to install your dependencies for you. This is just like a recipe for a Docker image, which sort of serves the same purpose, but instead of a virtual machine, as Yannick explained, we now have an image uh, that's much more lightweight um, and also faster in some cases. And uh, yeah. However, we also only have the Docker file now. We lack the actual image. We still need to build that. Um, so what we're going to do is to um, specify a GitHub action. And I will just quickly jump back into GitHub to show you what actions are about. Um, so this GitHub repository, ah, wait, let me first commit 
um, my changes. I guess that most of you know how to use Git, so I'm just going to quickly add all my stuff. Oops. Commit. It is a type right. Yep. And this is now inside my repository on GitHub. Okay. Um, this is tab called actions here. And actions are just automated jobs that I can have GitHub run for me. Um, and it suggests to me, since it's, it's finds a Docker file inside my repository somewhere, it suggests to me, hey, why don't you just run the publer, uh, Docker publish um, using GitHub Actions so you don't need to build it locally. You get all the nice uh, features of like automatically building the image and pushing it into the GitHub internal um, container registry. We are going to not use this template because there's some quirks to this template that I kind of a short look into it. Um, so what a GitHub action is, is just uh, a YML file that specifies uh, how to execute something. And um, this first tells me, okay, when should I do this? There are different like events that can trigger a GitHub action. In this case, it would get executed uh, yeah, at uh, run at some point every day. Um, it will also run if I push to my main branch, and it would also run if I have a pull request on my main branch. Um, and this is actually the, the part that I want to modify later in the GitHub action that we are going to build from scratch. We're just going to ignore all these automated um, triggers and just tell, okay, when I specifically pull the trigger and push and uh, click the run button, then you should run this job and you don't want any kind of automation beyond that. Then uh, GitHub Actions also can have environment variables. In our case, this will look exactly the same. We want to push to uh, GHCR, which is the GitHub container repository. It's an alternative to Docker Hub. And if you um, build images using GitHub Actions, as we would recommend, it's much easier to use this instead of Docker Hub because since GitHub Actions are authenticated within the GitHub ecosystem, um, you don't need to specify any kind of authentication tokens as you would need to with Docker Hub. And this um, basically, so these um, dollar sign and double columns is sort of a templating language. So you can inject variables into your um, action script and this is a predefined variable uh, that specifies the name of your repository. So we just want our image name on the um, container repository the same as the name of this uh, GitHub thing. Down here, we specify the actual job, um, what it runs on, what steps does it have, and we will define each of these steps now from scratch. So going back to the terminal. Um, so our Docker workflow needs to live in a special file location within your GitHub repository so that GitHub can find it and then execute it. Um, and this is the dot GitHub. But I think I have to create the directory first. Um, so I want dot GitHub, which is just a hidden folder that stores everything that is of concern to GitHub. And then inside that, we need a workflows directory. Work. Let me check if it's workflows or workflow. Workflows, yeah. Oh. Do I need to? Yeah, you need to add dash p or create them separately. Dash P, yeah, okay. Um, and then inside that I can uh, yeah, GitHub workflows. Um, I'm, I'm just going to call my doc Docker publish and YML will see like file ending because it's a YAML file. 
So my name is create and publish Docker image. And I want this to run whenever I trigger it manually. And the keyword for that for this, uh, for GitHub is workflow dispatch. Whenever I dispatch the workflow, it should actually run. I will specify two environment variables. Um, the one is called registry, and that specifies which container registry I want to push to. Um, this is ghcr.io. And the other one is the name of the image. And as before, this is just taken whatever the name of my GitHub repository is. So I'm going to use this templating syntax to inject um, the predefined uh, variable github.repository, which always holds the name of whatever repository you run this action on. Then I can uh, begin specifying my actual job. And um, there is one job inside here, which I will call build and push image. This job runs on an Ubuntu image. The irony here is that we run Docker inside a Docker container that runs on some kind of Dockerized hardware. So it's Docker all the way down. Um, it needs, uh, the job itself needs permissions to modify. Wait, I think I messed up the indenting here. So this should all be two spaces. Yeah, now it works. Um, this job needs two permissions. It needs to content, it needs to read the content of my repository and it needs access to write to the packages of my repository. Um, so there are different kinds of artifacts that a job can modify or, or read or get information from. One is the content, which is just whatever code you put into the repository. And then GitHub has this uh, packages publishing system um, and we want our job since we want to push a GitHub, uh, no, no, a Docker image to this repository or to this package repository. Um, we need to give it right access to that. And then we can define what steps our job consists of. Um, so the first thing is uh, that we want to check out. So we have a first step that's called check out. And most of these like basic steps that get done all over the place are actually predefined at some point. So we can import um, from GitHub Actions, which is just a bunch of different everyday tasks that someone already automated for us. So we can just import it. What this job or this step in the site, this job will do is just check out the repository that we are currently executing on into our, um, it's called a runner. So whatever hardware or every, if I trigger an action, it will spawn in this case, an Ubuntu image somewhere on a, on a server from GitHub. And then I can do with this image whatever I want. And this image that's running there is called a runner. And this first step just clones or checks out our repository into the file system of this uh, runner that our job uh, depends on. So as soon as this is done, I want to have the second step, um, which is called log in. And if I want to push my image to the uh, registry, the container registry of GitHub, I of course have to authenticate myself. So this job um, does that for me. It authenticates my runner so that it has uh, write privileges to my um, container repository. And of course, once again, uh, we can use a predefined uh, action for that. So we have this Docker login action that exactly does what, what we want and authenticates us against any kind of hub. Um, I think this would also work with Docker Hub. We are going to stick to um, the uh, GitHub container repository because this job needs three specified arguments. It needs a registry, it needs a username, um, and it needs a password. And if I do this with Docker Hub, I would need to specify the username and the password somehow 
Um, but it, it's a very bad idea to put them into plain text into my job file. So I would need to store them as an environment variable somewhere in my GitHub repository. And that's just a lot of overhead. If we push instead to the GitHub container repository, the job, since GitHub knows GitHub, um, we can just use environment variables that are already predefined that we don't have to set up in any way and we'll use that to authenticate. So the registry um, can be our, and of course, again, these uh, templating things just injects any value in, in there, whatever we write inside these web records is replaced with. Um, and the registry is whatever registry we defined up here. So this is just a dot syntax to access members of this field. We want the, from the key environments, we want the sub key registry and whatever value is here. So this ghcr.io would get placed instead of this template syntax right here. Then um, we need a username. And in this case, uh, we can just use github.actor, which is a predefined environment variable for any job that runs on GitHub. Um, as I mentioned before, if we were to use Docker Hub or any other kind of, or the Google Container Registry or any other uh, kind of Docker hosting solution, these lines would look a bit different because we would need to manually specify environmental variables that hold all, all this information for us. And we can, for the password, we all secrets.github um, token, which is just a predefined authentication token that our GitHub runner uses to, again, authenticate towards the registry. Okay, this finishes our login step. Um, the next one is, I will call it extract. So we want to, um, oh, there's a question, right? Julian, uh, don't we have to set up the secret first before being able to use it? Oh, good, good point. Um, so the secret is not required to be set up here, at least when I tested it, it work without setting it up explicitly, because GitHub will take care of this for us, because we are taking a GitHub repository and push to the um, container registry that's, that's associated with our repository. Um, GitHub knows that this is called like a, like a closed space and anyone who is authenticated to trigger such a job would also have the right permissions to actually push there. Um, so we can use this predefined GitHub token to authenticate ourselves. Um, Maybe I can also elaborate a bit more on that. Uh, it's actually not only the person triggering the job, but also um, the person owning the repository. So um, it can get quite messy if people commit to your workflow directory and do strange things there that we don't want them to do with your token. And I think there have been some issues with uh, leakage of those tokens um, because, yeah, I mean, you could just define something that pushes your tokens to the internet. But I think those tokens are also just single use and yes. be destroyed by yes. But the, it's still not uh, that old, this technology that might still be some changes in the future. Yeah. Um, so these tokens, as, as Nicholas already mentioned, are single use. So every job will get a unique token associated with it and can use that to, to authenticate, but only during the time span of the job. And then it just gets discarded. So even if we would leak this somewhere, it doesn't really matter. Um, however, if I would specify my own Docker Hub login data, um, then if it gets leaked, of course, since it's just general login data, it will be much worse. So it's generally advisable to uh, use the container registry that's uh, built into GitHub here. Um, okay, so we need to, the next step is to extract the meta metadata um, that we're going to use for Docker. So whatever our image is called, what text does it have, um, it has the global ID meta, and it uses um, another predefined action. We are not going to build anything new here because building a Docker image on GitHub is something that occurs so often that you can just rely on whatever whatever other people wrote as a solution for that. Um, so we have this metadata action which tags a container for us, um, and the 
with statements, specify some kind of arguments that I pass into these predefined actions. Um, and in this case, it takes an images argument, which is the name or the complete, um, I'm not sure what, what it's actually called, but the name of the image, um, which the first part will be the registry. You could think about this as the URL of an image that you would also put into a from statement in any other Docker file if you want to base it off. Or if you want to run this Docker file, you can put this URL into the one statement and then it will put it from wherever the registry specifies. Um, and of course, I not only want the registry, but I also want to give my image a name. So um, we have this other environment variable up here, which is called image name. Um, and I'm going to inject it into here. Okay, we now have an image. We have uh, the metadata specified, so everything is left is actually built, and then ship it off and push it to the container registry. So my last step in our overall job will be build and push. This. Once again, there is a solution for that, which is called the build and push action. These are versions, so there are different improvements made over time to these sort of jobs. So I think there's by now also version three, but I only tested version two, so let's stick to that. Um, and of course, this also needs uh, some um, some arguments. These will be uh, similar to arguments that you would locally use to specify your Docker run with. Um, so the first thing is a build context. Docker takes whatever you specify as a build context and gets all its data from there. So your Docker file should be in there. And any data you want to copy into your container has to live inside whatever you specify as a build context. Um, because to enable this uh, layer caching, Docker calculates hashes of whatever is in your build context to see if anything changed in there. Um, and in our case, we want our context to be just a local folder, which corresponds to the root level of our um, of our project that we uh, pushed into this job. So we have a context. Um, we can set push to true. This will just push whatever the resulting image is. There are some instances where you don't want to push, for example, if you just want to conduct any kind of integration tests against your Docker image or something like that, but don't necessarily want the image to be actually visible in your, uh, in your container registry. But in our case, the whole purpose of this job is to push it, so set push to true. Um, we can set different tags. Um, and we have this um wait let me let me finish the line and i'll explain what it does so outputs dot uh, tags and then labels the same thing steps meta outputs dot labels um so this steps dot meta dot outputs refers to the output of the step that I called meta. Um, and this metadata action basically takes some arguments um, that I specified down here, so my image name, and then automatically extracts all the tags and labels from this argument. Um, and so I can use the output of this step to specify tags and labels down here. And I don't have to write any code to do the extraction for me. I can just use whatever predefined job is there for that. Um, OK. And this will then build and push our image. Um, so I hope that I didn't make any typo here and that it will work right away. Um, I will add this job and commit it to my repository. And let's switch back to GitHub. So inside my repository, this folder now appeared, and I have the Docker published job, which is just whatever we just wrote. And also, if you now click on Actions, um, we don't see the suggested actions anymore because we defined something ourselves. And we can actually select our create and publish Docker image that we just specified. 
And um, of course, this has not been run yet. And this workflow has a workflow dispatch event trigger, just means this will not run until, until I explicitly press the run workflow button. So let's try that and see if our job succeeds. So it was requested and we have some error. It's not good. Check. And we have some kind of uh, line yeah, line 14. Unexpected value content. Let's see. Ah, yeah, it's missing an S. It should be contents. Um, so just let me quickly edit the file. Uh, so that's the typer over there. And the very tedious thing about these workflows is that the like test and development cycle is really odd because you always have to push a proposed change, see if it then runs. If not, make some changes, push it again. So hopefully this is the last time that I have to fix something in there. Um, I didn't switch windows. Okay, I just fixed the typo off screen. I forgot to switch to um, to the terminal view. Okay, let's go back to actions and try again if our new and approved workflow um, works now. So run workflow. Was requested. It takes some time for Docker to actually spin up our runner, and then we will as soon as that happens. Okay. Now our workflow seems to be valid and is currently running. So we can just click on it to um, see what it's currently doing. It has requested this Ubuntu image. It now has deployed it to a hosted runner. Hosted runner means that it's something that GitHub provides to us. Um, I think since Microsoft bought GitHub, public runners are free and unlimited, but private runners have some kind of runtime quota that you can't exceed, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But whatever we are going to do for this lab will not exceed also the private quota, so that's not a concern. Um, we're still waiting on this shared runner from GitHub to come online, um, so this will maybe take a couple of minutes and then the Docker image building process will also take a couple of minutes. So this would be a good point for any questions that you might have. Yes. Yes, we could do that on GitLab. Um, I'm not sure if GitLab has shared runners that, are, that you can just freely use. So if you, I think if you have, to, if you want to use GitLab, you have to host your own runner, right? Yeah, okay. And that's why we defaulted back to GitHub because we didn't want to go through the process of setting up a lot of shared runners for everyone to use. Um, so these are just there and available, but yes, GitLab. Also from my experience with GitLab, you can do everything that you see here, but with none of the code that you get. So all the YML syntax, or well, not the syntax, but the, the content is different. So uh, yeah. we have to decide uh, yeah. we should do it. So GitHub or GitLab um, has templates for this kind of thing, but these kind of sub-step templates, I think, are not yet implemented. But I haven't worked with the GitLab workflow in, in quite some time, so I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay, there were some mentions in the chat. Ah, yeah. Um, So one, one mentioned in the chat was that, uh, can you specify which branch the, uh, the action should run on? So you have a development branch and a production branch, and you want to build different Docker images. So both of these branches um, in the action menu, you can actually, if you trigger the job, um, you can select whatever branch or whatever tag you want to build this on. So if you have version tags for your repository, for example, you could build it for a specific version. Um, Maybe let me clear up a misconception. This tags there has nothing to do with Docker tags. This is yes. um, the tags that you assign in Git 
or in GitHub to branches or to commits. Yes. Uh, so this has nothing to do with the Docker, uh, Docker tags, but yes. you can, in the end, um, specify the tags that the Docker images will get with this uh, field over there. Um, just maybe to illustrate this, this would be a release tag of a GitHub project. So you could use the tag for 0.17.0 to specify whatever commit what was this of this, in this case, hugging face transformers GitHub repository. And if you were to tag your own repository like that, um, you could specify that there. Um, and yeah, that's, that would then be integrated into the um, name of your image. I'm not sure about labels. If, are labels interchangeably to tags, or is there like a second distinction? We specified some, but I'm not quite sure where they come from. <laughs> um, OK, just to quickly check in on this, um, we have now completed all these different steps. So we have set up this stop scrolling. Um, so we can here check out the output of each of our different steps that our job has. So setup just spins up a container for us, uh, a runner for us. Then the uh, checkout action um, checks out our GitHub repository. Um, then we have the login action that, fortunately for us, login succeeded. Um, the extract thing will um, extract the tags and images and names and uh, repository stuff and um, puts it into a JSON and this JSON then can get parsed by uh, other jobs down the line. And we are currently still in the uh, build and push phase of our job. So the um, output is truncated here, but apparently we successfully built our image and now it's just pushing the result to our container registry. Um, and yeah, we, we should be done in maybe half a minute or so. And then we can use that. Yes, yes. So yeah, while this still pushes our finalized image to uh, the registry, we will switch over to, um, to Niklas. I see in the chat, um, the action failed, that mostly means that you will likely have some kind of typo in your commands. Um, mm, don't see any. Yeah, I don't see any typos either, but you can check, we, we already put um, the solution on the web page. So the whole GitLab action should be also accessible there if you want to compare it line by line, for example. Uh, to find your error, you can uh, download the GitHub action here and also the Docker file. Uh, okay, now downloaded in my case, but um, oh, you used the Docker file that's specified there, that's odd. Um, then I will have to check again if the version that's committed here matches whatever we programmed because what we programmed just worked out. I will, I will check back while Niklas presents and then uh, see if there are any changes necessary. Okay, 